The early Triassic, a time of recovery for the planet and the few species that remain after the greatest extinction event of all time. These hardy survivors have one advantage, and that is that there is little competition from other species, and many niches are completely vacant. In the shallow lagoons of what will one day be China, some species have adapted to this new yet harsh world, carving out a life in the few areas that have somewhat recovered. Eridmore hibis is a strange aquatic reptile that seems to be a fusion of multiple animals, with a long, stiff body, broad, paddle-like limbs, and a strange small head. They are some of the weirdest looking residents of the entire Triassic. They live in these protected shallow waters, and many can be seen resting on the beaches, rocks, and rock pools on the shoreline. However, most of their time is spent below the waves, searching for a meal. Using their foreflippers and their tails, they effortlessly fly through the water, returning to the surface for air before diving to the seafloor not far below them. It is here, and amongst the rocks and sea plants, that they find their food. Eridmore hippus have rather small flat heads, and their eyes are minuscule, so they rarely use them when hunting. Instead, their jaws or bills have special sensors on them that can detect the movement of invertebrates, both in the water and in the sediment. When they detect movement, they move their jaws through the sand and debris, snapping up the small creatures or flicking them into the open where they are easy to catch. There is no shortage of invertebrates in the sands and amongst the rocks, but the Eridmore hippus cannot consume them all. Some are poisonous, others like the sea scorpions fight back and aren't worth it. There are also those that swim freely in the water, such as jellyfish and ammonites, but the former have stinging tentacles, and the latter have hard-armed shells. So despite getting up to a meter long, the Eretmore hippus are restricted to small prey, a problem amplified by their small head. The lagoons where they make their homes are mostly peaceful and plentiful with few land predators. There are, however, predators in the ocean, but during low tide, many don't risk the shallow waters for fear of getting beached or cut off. When high tide rolls in, the illusion of safety can all too easily be shattered. The rising waters bring with them early ichthyosaurs. These fully marine reptiles are fast, and unlike the Eretmore hippus, have massive eyes that help them pick out prey even in the dead of night. A group of ichthyosaurs swim into the lagoon when the tide is at its peak, looking for easy prey. The humble Eretmore hippus are too preoccupied rummaging through the seafloor to see the first hunter coming. One of them is struck from the side, and the ichthyosaur shakes its victim violently. The nearby Eretmore hippus detect both the intruder and the death of one of their own, and flee towards shallower water. But the little reptiles are nowhere near as sleek and streamlined as the ichthyosaurs, and so some crawl into crevices where the predators can't reach, or climb out of the water onto rocks out of reach of their jaws. Most make it to the shore, however, awkwardly hauling themselves up the sand. One in the rear pauses with its tail still in the water. This would be his downfall. Like a modern orca beaching itself to catch a seal, one of the ichthyosaurs torpedoes through the waves and grabs the smaller reptile's tail in its long jaws. Partially beached, the predator flings the struggling prey backwards, and using its tail and fins pushes back into the sea, dooming the helpless Eridmore hippus. The rest of the group catches their breath and will wait till the tide goes out again. The early Triassic is a golden era for Eretmore Hippus, and its family, the Hubisukians. Unfortunately for them, it will not last long. By the middle Triassic, almost all will be extinct. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the Triassic's equivalent of the platypus, Eridmore hippus. Eridmore hippus's first remains were discovered in 1991 in the Jiliangjiang Formation in Hubei, China. The holotype was almost complete, except for the skull, but more remains would be discovered in subsequent years in the same location, including two in 2018, one of which had a full skull giving us a good understanding of its skeletal anatomy. Eridmore hippus lived in the early Triassic, not long after the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. It belonged to a group called the Hupasukians, 
a small family of mostly marine reptiles, not too distantly related from ichthyosaurs. This group contained multiple species with long bodies and often long, thin mouths, with Eratmorhippus being labelled as the most derived of its group. Eratmorhippus itself grew up to one metre long, and probably only weighed a few kilograms. Now let's get on to its anatomy, starting at the tail. As we can see from this diagram, Eratmorhippus' tail was long with a lot of vertebra, which may have made it quite inflexible, and would have been used to propel itself through the water. The vast amount of vertebra continues along the body, most of which are connected to a vast amount of ribs, along the animal's side, and on the underside is a dense array of gastilla, or belly ribs. These would have aided the muscles in its abdomen, however with how dense they are, they would have restricted its ability to move its body, so much so it has been compared to a stiff, rounded tube. Members of the Hupasuchians all have three layers of overlapping osteoderms over their spines, but in Eratmorhippus, its third layer is much larger than any other member of its family. Each one is the length of four vertebra, and has been compared to the plates of stegosaurs. What these were used for is up for debate. They may have been for display or for heat exchange. Regardless, they were likely a hindrance to when Eratmorhippus was swimming, but may have been efficient armour. Eridmorhippitus limbs are unique amongst its family, as it's the only one of them that has manual and pedal digits that extend from the limb to create a fan-like shape. These long and wide limbs would have made excellent flippers that could have been quite flexible and manoeuvrable, so despite its stiff body, it could have twisted and steered itself relatively well in the water, but was likely sluggish on land. Now we come to its rather small head. Scientists have compared Eric Morhippita's skull to the modern platypus, and it has more in common with this monotreme than one might think. Both have very small eyes, so its sight was likely not very good, and therefore not used for finding prey. So what was it using instead? Platypuses use electroreception to hunt. They have special receptors in their bill that can pick up the electrical signals made by prey's muscle movement, while also allowing it to feel and move around the water without any of its other senses. Judging by the shape and gaps in the skull of Eratmorhippus, scientists believe that this Triassic reptile could have been doing something similar. If we look at their skulls side by side, the blue represents the soft cartilage that contains the electroreceptors on a platypus, with the pink representing the same in Eratmorhippus. So as we can see, the similarities between these two completely different animals from completely different times is a lot more than superficial. We can say with some confidence that Eratmorhippus would hunt by searching the seafloor by rummaging through the sand and silt, or sticking its head between rocks, snapping up anything small enough to fit in its mouth, including worms and shrimps. Though its body may not have been very flexible, it could always detect prey wherever they were, thanks to the electroreceptors in its jaws, and could still manoeuvre quite well thanks to its large flippers. Perhaps their eyes were reduced because the water they lived in wasn't very clear, and they didn't need them as much when they could simply rely on touch. We know that Eratmorhippus lived in a massive lagoon area, with the surrounding region being much like an archipelago. Eratmorhippus' ancestors would have been one of the few to make it through the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. Despite that, the family of Hupasukians recovered incredibly fast, in the early Triassic, there were many species surviving in some of the few areas that recovered quickly, after the planet's worst mass extinction event. But after the early Triassic, they seemed to disappear, likely unable to contest other species that evolved later on, and were better evolved to exploit the niches that Eratmorhippus and other Hupasukians had held. Eratmorhippus has got to be one of the strangest creatures to evolve during this time. From its overly armoured body to its shockingly platypus-like head, it's a symbol of how adaptive life is, and how endlessly unique it can be. But what do you think of Eratmorhippus? And for my question of the week, do you think the Hupasukians had any chance of making it to see the end of the Triassic? Let me know what lesser known animal you'd like me to do a breakdown on next, and until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.